Who's the pig? Are you talking to me? Uh oh, he called the pig. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Now they're in for it. They call me Mr. Pig! Ah! Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. Now, if you like this video, you should interact with it. I encourage that. I appreciate that. And for those that have, great job. Thank you. This is pretty much the worst video ever made. Napoleon, like anyone can even know that. So today, I want to talk about an artist from the Renaissance. An artist that is a master painter that gets a little bit overshadowed by some of the others. And he's a master painter by the name of Titian. Now, where have we heard that name before? Let me think. And this is for real. His name is spelled T-I-T-I-A-N. Titian, honest to God. <laughs> as, as interesting as that is, uh, we may have heard of him there, but the uh, information might be a little bit askew. So, why don't we take a little bit of an opportunity ourselves today and talk a little bit about some information regarding the Renaissance master painter Titian. One of history's greatest painters of flesh was the 16th century Venetian painter Taya Vicelio, widely known as Titian. As is characteristic of Venetian arts, Titian excelled in his use of color and form through the buildup of layers in his paintings. Even the very best of them all, Michelangelo Bonarotti, admired the handling and use of color exhibited by Titian, although Michelangelo was not as impressed at all by his drawing abilities. Titian's works were largely created on canvas using oil paint, as he is one of the first artists to move from painting on wood planks to canvas. Now his first step in painting was applying a dark red stain onto that canvas. Then he would build up a monochrome underpainting and transparent glazes were added. Then a series of 30 to 40 finish coats are applied on top of that. So it is quite a process. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, what exactly is your point? As I always tell my students, you've got to layer, layer, layer these things up to make it look good. And Titian is the example that I often use. Titian began his career as the student of Sebastian Zaccato, a mosaic artist, when Titian was only 10 years old. Five years later, he would go on to study underneath the Benelli brothers, Gentile and Giovanni, who were locally known painters. This is where he began to develop his highly personal painting style. This was developed through his loose brushwork and subtle tone. He was one who always was striving to reach perfection in his paintings, and he started to really get there with some great instruction. It's important to be educated. Titian had clients that ranged from churches and governments to nobles and aristocrats. His reputation excelled him to become one of the court painters of the King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. In fact, he was the only painter allowed to paint the portrait of the emperor. As is pretty customary in the Renaissance time period, Titian would use a very strong humanistic perspective in his work. People were the highest importance in his art. While in Rome, the famous Titian began to create a series of reclining nudes. Now the first one here is called the Venus uh, of Urbizo. All right, I'm sorry, that's Urbino. This concept was not original. He was very much inspired by the painting that is based on the influence of the sleeping Venus created by Casalfranco. This distinguished himself as an amazing portrait painter. Throughout the work we see his high mastery of textures through silk, velvet, carved wood, 
marble, and flesh. The reclining nude is associated with the goddess Venus. Seeing the rose in her hand, we know that she is a Venus, as the rose is a symbol of the Venus and love. We may also note the dog in the painting. Dogs are a strong Renaissance symbol of fidelity. Noting that the dog is asleep, what might this mean in the painting? What ain't no country I ever heard of? They speak English and what? Does this mean that her faithfulness is also at rest? Now this is a matter of debate, although I would probably lean towards the no, because the painting was commissioned for a man's to-be wife, and what kind of message would that send to her through this gift? Anyway, based on that fact, many things can be assumed about the intentions of this sensually charged painting. This work has been critiqued by notable icons such as Mark Twain and, of course, E. Buzz Miller. This is Art Classics. I'm your host, E. Buzz Miller. Now, Mark Twain, he noted the painting in A Tramp Abroad, where he would refer to the work as the obscenest picture that the world possesses. Now, I think that's a little bit harsh, but in 1880, I can understand where his mind was kind of at. And of course, this painting would inspire many other works, including Edouard Manet's famous Olympia. But in her defense, again in the words of Mark Twain, there she has the right to lie, for she is a work of art, and art has its privileges. And this is a bona fide art treasure, and I don't think anybody could disagree that this is a really nice painting of a broad on a couch. <laughs> Creating portraits of nobles, kings, and aristocrats was Titian's calling card. By becoming known in these high-status circles, he developed an international clientele. Titian had several patrons, but none of them more consistent and more beneficial to his work than the Habsburg family. For you non-historical buffs, this is the family that is linked to the Spanish monarchy, who Titian personally did work for for over 40 years. He developed a system of creating formal portraits where the sitter was depicted in life-size and framed by curtains or architectural elements that draw the attention to the majestic and impressionless face of the sitter. Although not as known as Rembrandt Van Rijn or Diego Velasquez, his portraits definitely stack up with the very best of all time. Most artists will resort to the occasional self-portrait, even if there's no other reason than to exercise their skill development or to dabble in experimentation. Now, my favorite Titian self-portrait is the one that was created in 1566. With his powerful profile that really pops from the dark corners of his dimly lit studio, this work was later sold to Peter Paul Rubens and then bought for the Spanish collection of the Prado, which is where I got to see the work back in 2010. An absolutely great example. Oh, you're right. As Titian got older and closer to the end of his life, he became more and more obsessed with his work. He was so self-critical that he managed to only finish a handful of works there at the end. Some were worked and reworked for upwards of 10 years each. As one might assume, he would definitely work several canvases at one time and meticulously critique each one before it was considered finished. This was oftentimes attributed to his very high standards, and he wanted his work never to diminish in quality and died a very respected and quite wealthy artist. Because of his very noble end of life, Titian took the profession of being an artist from being a labor craft status to one of a respected profession. Always good at diplomacy, we can thank Titian for helping us create a more positive world view of what it was to be an artist, what it is to be an artist, than it was before his time. What a great example. Oh man, I love that story. Thanks for letting me share it with you. Have a great day. Here's another one.
painted by the same guy, Tidian. He painted these brides in 1555, so it's a classic.